No one who saw it happening could understand why it was happening, or really that it was happening. Roscoe, their co-worker in a small Christian publishing ministry, endured a home life almost beyond imagination. His marriage was extremely rocky, with a wife whose mood swings and temper tantrums put him through day and night torment. She would call him up at the office and berate him for imagined offenses, things he had or hadn't done. Well, since she was a screamer, secretaries, even across the hallway, could hear her groundless accusations and threats. Twice, Sylvia had moved out on her husband, only to return in a sulky pout. This is the last time for sure, she'd mutter, as if her coming back were a huge gift to him. In her condition, the woman couldn't keep a job, so Roscoe gamely tried to hold the family together financially on his modest income. But the two teenage sons, both of them also dysfunctional, sullen kids, wasted away the family money with their repeated parking tickets and fender benders and phone calls. Roscoe, as lonely head of the family, tried his best to establish discipline and control things in the home, but with, with it being one against three and with his wife's irrational moods, it was simply a losing battle. And yet, somehow, the emotionally battered man kept on ticking. He came to work each Monday and greeted his fellow workers with a smile. How was your weekend? He'd inquire. If someone asked him the same question back, well, he'd make a familiar little gesture with his hand, hanging in there. Yes, sir, God is good. Only a very few knew how vicious and painful a 48 hours he'd just been through, how counseling and Sylvia's manic shopping sprees had eaten away his entire life savings. You know, as I read a story like that and sense the raw reality of his quiet, secret heartache, it gives me a new appreciation for something Paul says here over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, earlier in this passage, he's made the point that all of us are stewards. Our gifts and talents and abilities come from God. He's in ultimate control, and we answer to Him. But in verse 9, Paul moves into a different theme with a decidedly changed tone. It seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. And then in verses 11 to 13, he adds, To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. In Roman society around AD 55, the imagery of a king's military procession was an intensely real one. Prisoners of war, or maybe just common criminals, staggered at the very tail end of the line. Here were the dregs of society about to be tossed to the lions. The Christian faith was new, still in its infancy. To be ridiculed for believing it was a common experience, and for someone like Paul, the outspoken evangelist for a radical, unconventional new faith, verbal abuse must have been a very much daily experience for the apostle. That's why it's so hard to relate to his testimony when we are cursed, we bless. How many of us do that? When we are persecuted, we endure it. Instead of retaliating, notes one commentary. And here's maybe the hardest of all. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. I think of Roscoe who endured literal persecution 
No, lions didn't maul him in the arena, but psychologically, a bear waited for him at the house each night. Three bears, actually, and yet this modern-day Paul endured the persecution. He responded to his wife's barrage of curses and slander with blessings and kind answers, never speaking ill about his wife, even to his closest confidence in the boardroom. She's making real progress. It was about as close as he would come to an admission that things were difficult. One day at a time, that's our motto. But how can we experience even the tiniest sample of such a miracle? Kind answers for slander? That's almost a completely foreign thought. How can something like this become our testimony? Let's notice one thing immediately. What Paul describes here in 1 Corinthians 4 is also the very character of our Savior, Jesus, blessing those who cursed him, enduring persecution instead of retaliating, answering slander with kind words. The Bible contains repeated instances in which Jesus epitomized such a lifestyle. He opened not his mouth, the Bible says. Yet he healed people, knowing as he glimpsed into the future that the same men and women would soon be taunting him, crying for his death, helping to hoist up his cross. He blessed Judas on that Thursday evening in the upper room, realizing in all its sordid details how his own disciple had made a bargain to sell him out for the price of a slave. And still he blessed him. Jesus loved him. Speaking with kindness and diplomacy, he tried even at that last hopeless hour to spare the dignity of the wretched traitor. What you're going to do, do, and go quickly. He murmured quietly, not exposing Judas's horrible act of betrayal to the other eleven. And then on the cross itself come those absolutely foreign, otherworldly, unbelievable words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. How can something like this possibly be? I mean, it turns the world upside down. Praying for your enemies, loving them, not resenting their insults, their verbal crowns of thorns as well as the literal ones. I can see two avenues toward victory here. And please don't get the idea that I've driven my little Ford Fiesta car very far up either road myself. But first, I go back to the beginning of this chapter in which Paul simply places events and people and the rough and tumble of all relationships into the hands of God. Don't judge people, he tells us. That's God's job. And God is up to the task. Wouldn't he equally encourage us? Lonnie, don't resent people either. Don't hate them. Don't long for their destruction, their payback time. If it comes to that, God will handle it. If someone deserves to fall, to meet their demise, a higher judge than you and I will handle it. He'll mete out whatever punishments there needs to be. Our hot little insults, our return volleys, our counter punches aren't really necessary when God is watching it all. Even those Christians who went to the real lions somehow sensed that God was watching over them, not always to protect and rescue, though he sometimes did. But they felt the presence of their Heavenly Father. They knew his eyes were taking it all in, and they were content to leave their own fate and even their enemies' fates in his powerful hands. As for point number two, again, Look to Jesus instead of to people. But Jesus saw people differently than we do. Even those who were whipping him, insulting him, crucifying him, slashing him with their studded belts and their cruel words, 
He looked through his blood and their rage and saw something different. He perceived broken people and wanted to fix them, recognizing the sickness of their souls. He desired to heal. Knowing how far they had fallen, he longed to pick them up and restore them. Beyond tarnished lives, he caught a glimpse of the original jewels he and his father had conceived in the original creation. Roscoe, who endured such grief from his wife, somehow had that kind of eyes in that shrill, impossible woman who had tormented him for two decades. He could still see a bride. He remembered the earlier sweetness, the brief loving moments before sin came in. Memories of times of courtship, years when love really was easy, a natural feeling instead of a gritty spiritual discipline. They still lingered. And this giant of a Christian, while leaving things in God's hands, was also able to keep on wearing the glasses of love. He looked at Sylvia and forced himself to see the bride God wanted to bring back. That's the kind of vision and love I long to have. I want to trust God more so that I can love the unlovely people who may still lurk in my life. Every tiny flash of success God gives us in this area is a victory for the entire body of Christ. A Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary on 1 Corinthians 4.12 observes that, and I'm quoting, the quality of bearing abuse patiently and doing good to one's persecutors is a prominent feature of real Christianity. It is evidence that the Holy Spirit is controlling the individual. For that, you can go and look at Galatians 5.22. Such an attitude is contrary to worldly philosophy, which teaches defense of one's rights and prompt retaliation for injuries or slights received from others. The followers of Christ are taught to leave the matter of revenge to the justice of God. Thank you.